I'm here to, um, to give a bit of an overview about outcomes measurement and hopefully to stimulate some debate and discussion after um, the talk. I want to start with a story. Some of you may have heard this in the news last week. It was first raised by uh, the ABC in their PM program last Friday on the 19th of September. The ABC's Anne Connolly reported, quote, the deaths of two women with dementia who were residents in top private nursing homes have raised serious questions about how aged care facilities are regulated. The two women who died were Katerina, Katerina Mont Alto, a resident of R Care Hampstead in Melbourne, she died in 2011 after falling into a fountain at the nursing home. The second woman's name was Beryl Watson. She died after a three week stay in respite care at Bupa Kempsey Nursing Home in Northern New South Wales. Katerina was found floating uh, face down in the fountain by one of the nurses. And the coroner's report stated that instead of um, the, coroner, the coroner's court later heard that instead of admitting the failure to monitor the dementia residents, staff changed her clothes, put her in bed and told her family that she'd suffered from a heart attack. The nurse who found Katerina was actually a whistleblower called police um, who were then alerted to the incident and found out the real reason that Katerina passed away because it was captured on CCTV footage. Beryl Watson went to the Kempsey nursing home for three weeks of respite. Her husband Clive had dropped her off, picked her up three weeks later and found she was seriously ill. He took her to the local hospital where she was diagnosed with pneumonia, malnutrition and dehydration. She died two weeks later. In Katerina's case, the coroner found that our care had a reactive rather than a proactive culture to safety of their residents. Arcane subsequently removed the fountain, they changed some of their policies and processes and the regulator, which is now called the Australian Aged Care Quality Agency, didn't change the status of our care Hampstead home in terms of meeting the standards. In fact, its official audit says that the home meets all of the necessary standards. Beryl's husband, Clive, pursued Beryl's case through the coroner's court as well after he said Bupa management failed to acknowledge his concerns about her care. The coroner found that while Bel Beryl was really ill when she was admitted to the nursing home and she was towards the end of her life, that quote, a series of cascading mistakes or oversights had led to her demise. She had a back sore, she wasn't eating, she wasn't drinking, um, and she declined significantly during her stay at the nursing home. Bupa Kempsey was also assessed by the Australian Aged Care Quality Agency actually just four months after Beryl passed away. The aged care regulator found no problems at all with the nursing home and it actually received what they call a perfect score, meaning all of the necessary standards. Charmaine Crow, who's actually the um, CEO of Combined Pensioners Superannuations Association, said that the cases show that the system of regulation isn't actually working properly. If this kind of poor ne care, neglect, abuse was occurring in our childcare system, there'd be a Royal Commission straight away. And I think that it's well overdue that we have a Royal Commission into the aged care industry, as well as nursing homes in particular, so that you know we can lay everything out on the table. These two stories are really sad. My first thought after hearing these last Friday was, what's going on here? And, I, and a little bit of alarm given that I have a mother in a nursing home with Parkinsonian's disorder and also dementia. My second thoughts were much more related to my work. And, and I was actually thinking about, well, what are these necessary standards? Um, and I really had um, three key questions about how these two nursing homes got the 100% test results. One, what are the standards? Two, how are the standards measured? And three, how are the standards reported? Well, it turns out that the standards are a recent amendment to the 1997 Age Care Act and they fit with the Australian Government's uh, 24th of June 2014 released Quality of Care Principles, which is an amendment to that earlier Act. The standards cover 44 outcomes within four key areas, management systems, health and personal care needs, lifestyle, things like personal, civic, social, community engagement, and safety and comfort. 
I won't go over what those 44 um, standards are, but they have to meet the accreditation standards to be eligible for government funding and for, for subsidisation. And let me give some credit where some credit's due. A big tick that, the, that there, is out, there are some outcomes being mentioned and intention to measure outcomes. That funding is supposed to be tied to these outcomes and via the fairly newly developed My Age Care website, there's a whole lot of information about these standards available on the website. But if you're ever in the unenviable position of having to make a decision about an aged care facility for yourself, for a family member, for somebody else, and given that the stats on aged care um, rise every year and have continued to do so at a quite a steep curve over the last decade, a lot of us will be in this position. You need to know whether you can ask yourself a few questions. Is there enough information from the standards and the way that things are measured and reported for you to make decisions about comparisons of the quality of aged care to make an informed decision about which aged care facility you would invest in if you're lucky enough to have the private funding to do so? And to ensure that the outcomes that really matter to you and your family member are upheld. After a little bit of a preliminary analysis of the law, of the standards and of the accreditation process, and, and it is preliminary and I probably need to look into it some more, my preliminary answer is no. The way that outcomes are measured, the way that the accreditation process works and the way that they're reported, there is not enough information to make that informed decision. I don't think there's enough information to empower any consumers around the comparing the quality of residential aged care um, or to tell the rest of us what actually might be going on here. This is an excerpt of the results from the most recent audit that was done on the aged care home where my mother-in-law is actually living, which, which will remain nameless. If I can get the mouse to work for me. Basically what it shows is just the third standard. The third standard is all about lifestyle outcome measurement. And you can see from the list, there's some pretty good outcomes being measured here. And they're things that are important that we do want to see being assessed in the standard. The interesting challenge with this, you can see on the right, is the accreditation decision is either a yes or a no. You either pass or you fail. So what we see with those 100% test results is almost all of the reports that you open, it's like, you know, everybody has, yes, you meet 44 of the 44 standards, but it's a yes, no. What this table shows is that third standard about lifestyle outcomes. What we can see in this table are the expected lifestyle outcomes. Some of the outcomes are really great. They're things that we actually want to achieve for people living in residential aged care and people living in residential aged care would want to achieve for themselves. Interestingly though, the right hand side of the table shows us that it's actually just a pass fail. It's a yes, you either meet the outcome or you don't. What it actually doesn't tell us is it doesn't enable systematic comparison between aged care facilities or an ability for us to look at one particular report of a particular aged care facility and to understand whether and how things have improved over time. A yes, no doesn't give us a scale of whether we're improving or not improving. I'm just using the aged care sector as one example but it's certainly not alone. Generally, we're not effectively measuring reporting outcomes to assist us to make informed decisions or to know whether we're achieving our aims or making social progress. So why measure? People have written across sectors, issues and portfolios about a whole range of reasons for measuring outcomes. Most of these outcomes can be categorised and they're shared across social purpose groups despite the sector that people come from. I'm going to go through what some of these headline why measure outcome areas are. Organisations, agencies, enterprises and businesses can gain learning and development benefits as a result of measuring outcomes. There's evidence that they obtain organisational knowledge through better understanding client needs and satisfaction and they're able to improve their organisational performance. Secondly, in terms of communication and branding, measuring outcomes can help organisations and enterprises to appeal to funders and donors, can increase their organisational legitimacy and communicate and celebrate achievements. 
Actually, for any sector, having outcomes to communicate is going to assist with a narrative. It could be a narrative for politics, a narrative for profiling, or just for some kind of exposure. Thirdly, the third area where you'll see benefit from measuring outcomes is around accountability and compliance. Indeed, accountability and compliance are one of the primary drivers for why different groups measure outcomes. Trish Lumley from the UK found that funder requirements are the primary reason for an increase in impact measurement. And similarly in Australia, Barraket and Yusufpur's research into social enterprises found that compliance demands of existing grant funders were a primary motivation for measurement. Accountability to funders, to shareholders and donors is a driver across any particular sector. Accountability to the public is also important. When governments provide tax benefits for social investments, it is reasonable to demand that the money be wisely invested to create as much social impact as possible. In Australia, government accountability to the public for how they spent their funding increased somewhat in the shift from closed to open government. That is, the significant increase in funding to the third sector to provide many of the public goods and, and to deliver services that occurred under the Howard government. Organisations, agencies, enterprises and business talk about gaining learning and development benefits from measuring outcomes. They obtain organisational knowledge through better understanding of client needs and satisfaction and they're able to improve organisational performance. It also helps organisations and enterprises to appeal to funders and donors, increase organisational legitimacy and communicate and celebrate achievements. For any sector, having outcomes to communicate will obviously assist with any kind of narrative, whether it's about politics, whether it's about profiling, whether it's about exposure. A second key benefit of measuring outcomes is around accountability and compliance and it's probably one of the ones that comes up most frequently. In fact, it's been found to be the primary driver for measuring outcomes, particularly in the UK. Tris Lumley has done some research that basically shows it's the, the, the major reason why non-profits measure in the UK. Um, and similarly, some work done in Australia by one of my colleagues, Jo Barraket, and one of her colleagues shows that social enterprises tend to say that compliance demands of existing grant funders are the primary motivation for measuring outcomes. But accountability to funders, accountability to shareholders, accountability to donors is going to be a drive for anyone across any particular sector. The other group we should think about is accountability to the public. It's pretty reasonable to expect that if governments are going to give tax breaks to particular groups for social investment, that we should be accountable to the public for the outcomes we achieve. <coughs> In Australia, government accountability actually took an interesting turn when, when government shifted from sort of what we call closed government to more open government under the Howard um, reign. Basically, when they shifted a whole lot of the funding into the third sector to deliver um, public services and supports, there were changes that came along with it around accountability for that funding. So in 1997, the Howard government introduced the Financial Management and Accountability Act which basically required governments to report against that funding. They had to be accountable for how that money was being spent. Similarly, we've had a recent replacement in 2013, the Public Governance and Performance and Accountability Act of June of that year requires the appropriate management of public resources and annual reporting of performance of Commonwealth funded entities. And this idea of reporting performance goes beyond just financial <laughs> performance. Increased efficiency is obviously another um, classic uh, benefit for measuring outcomes. It's talked about all of the time and frequently and across centres, across some sectors. Governments have limited resources. The burden on other sectors is increasing. People want to know where do they spend the limited money they've got for the biggest return. The last two, um, organisational sustainability. Organisational sustainability is increasingly becoming recognised as being much more important uh, in terms of why you would measure outcomes. In a, a recent book that's been released this year by Epstein and Muthas on measuring and improving social impacts, a guide for non-profits, companies and impact investors, they argue that although budgets, fundraising and efficiency are important, social impact is the new bottom line 
for the social sector. This is partly because measuring and reporting outcomes are going to drive funding. It's going to help you be more competitive. Um, with effective shared measurements, organisations can obviously benchmark for themselves, but also benchmark themselves against other organisations and advertise that in the sector. It will mean that there's a better understanding for clients and consumers around which services will give them what types of outcomes. And hopefully it will mean that organisations will provide a better service. I mean, in addition, governments and funders are increasingly expected, expecting and indeed requiring people to report outcomes. I think the other interesting shift around um, measuring outcomes being important for organisational sustainability is in relation to the market changes in some of the social sectors that we're seeing. So let's take the National Disability Insurance Scheme, for example. By changing the customer from the government giving the funding to the service provider to the people with disability being the customers that give the funding to the service provider for goods and services that they choose to use, they're changing the market. As a person with a disability, if you are then making decisions about which services you use, are you going to pick the service that measures outcomes and can tell you what you're going to get for the money that you spend? Or are you going to invest in a service that, does, that doesn't report or gather or transparently um, talk about outcomes? And I think the aged care example that I gave earlier, um, this also applies. If the right information is available, empowered, informed consumers are going to use outcomes to make the decisions about the services and supports that they use. And I'd argue that organisations who don't measure outcomes are going to get left behind. Possibly the most important of all of these I've left to the last, and it's the importance of actually making a difference. Why do we measure outcomes? Because we want to know whether we're making a difference. We want to make social progress. Social purpose organisations obviously want to, um, we hope and need to, meet the values, the missions and the goals that they aspire to and usually espouse. Without measuring outcomes, organisations really can only talk about numbers. How much they do, how many people they work with and how much it costs. But are they really making a difference? Epstein and Euthus argue that too much money is being squandered by well-intended but yet failed attempts to deliver important social changes. And the big question that I think we need to ask ourselves as a country is, are we really making a difference here in Australia? The, the, the magic number Andrew's been doing some work on this uh, with CSI. Uh, we spend about $300 billion on the Australian social impact sector per year. But in too many communities, on too many social issues, <coughs> things are not changing. They're not changing fast enough or they're getting worse. I'm going to give you a, um, a dump of just how lucky this country is. One in five Australians has a mental illness. About one in five has a disability. Both of those um, conditions place somebody at a higher risk of being more socially isolated, less likely to be employed. If they are employed, they're more likely to be employed part-time. They're also less likely to have the educational attainment um, and engagement that the rest of us have. We have an ageing population which has profound social and economic implications. Our health and aged care costs are rising. Our workforce is shrinking as our baby boomers retire. And the number of those who find jobs is smaller than those who lose them or leave them. At the same time, we've got youth unemployment rates that are at a 12-year high. We battle housing affordability, Median housing prices and rents continue to rise. Australia actually has a shortage of about 600,000 available and affordable rental properties. One quarter of a million of Australians are on social housing waiting lists. 60,000 of those have been deemed to be in the greatest need. We have about one in 200 Australians who are homeless on any given night. Homelessness seems to be somewhat of an intractable social problem. 
and the gap between Indigenous and non-Indigenous Australians is vast. And the Prime Minister's 2014 report that was released in March on closing the gap <coughs> basically showed that Australia is failing to close the gap on many of the COAG targets. In the Prime Minister's words, we are not on track to achieve the more important and more meaningful targets. Many of these social problems overlap. You can't, for example, help an unemployed young person to find work if um, the job won't last, if he's homeless, um, if he has nowhere to wash or clean his clothes, if he has depression, if he has a substance use disorder. Australia's level of inequality has actually increased over the last few decades. And our position on, on the international inequity list has risen. It's nothing to be proud of. <coughs> this gap isn't just a problem for those who are left behind. As economists like Nobel Prize winning Professor Joseph Stiglitz have shown, the cost of inequality affects the functioning of society. It affects the stability and the sustainability of our economy. And all this is at a time when government resources are scarcer and will become increasingly more challenging. Our social progress is arguably stymied because we don't or haven't concentrated enough on outcomes. What is it that we're trying to achieve? To what extent have we met these goals? How and under what circumstances? How do different approaches and processes affect that change? The numbers are holding us back. I think we've been hampered by counting the numbers of people and Dalton activities and the dollars that we've spent. We're so good at counting numbers. We're, we're great at it at a program level, at a sector level, and at a population level. Administrative data sets, for example, as most of you would know, can tell us some really great stuff about how many people are involved in all sorts of programs and schemes, about where they're from, about what activities they've done, what they've had for breakfast. There's a whole lot of information. It's, it's overwhelming how much data there's actually is around. But what about outcomes? The short, the medium, the longer term changes that have actually occurred, they're much less, much less likely. And sometimes they're measured, and sometimes they're measured really well. But often, as is the case in that aged care story that I was talking about, often they're not measured that well. We're not measuring the right outcomes. We're not measuring effectively. <coughs> we can't compare outcomes. And we're not necessarily transparent in how we share what outcomes we find. And when we fail, we don't want to tell anyone about it, which means we don't learn and we continually duplicate mistakes. I think the message is really quite simple. If we want to make progress, counting numbers of people and activities isn't enough. We've got to move from counting the numbers to measuring the change that's been achieved. I think we need to be able to answer some fundamental questions. Things like, and there's a whole list of them, but things like, are people really any better off? Are our children, our young people, our adults, our families, our communities, are they any happier? Are they any healthier? Do they have a better quality of life? Are they able to participate in education, in employment, in community? Are people more resilient, more included? Do they feel like that they belong? Do we know whether our services, our enterprises, our innovations and our supports are actually changing lives, community and society? <coughs> And do we know where to spend and shift our limited resources for social change? At CSI, and some of you who've been familiar with the work that we do, we have a social impact framework. Within the social impact framework, we, we work across not-for-profit, for-profit, um, government, and, um, and we look at all sorts of levels, individual level, meso level, macro level. Our social impact framework sets up our theory of change. We want to look at how systems and organisations can work more effectively. How do they generate more social impact? It, in a nutshell, it basically asks, what are we trying to achieve? 
what are the solutions, innovations and supports we're trying to um, provide to achieve the social impact? How do we go about it? And how do we know that we're making a difference? A lot of this framework and anything that's in blue basically relies on outcomes measurement in some capacity. We've got to know what outcomes we actually want to achieve. We want to know that the things that we're funding are about outcomes, not activity. As far as collaboration goes, shared measurement is absolutely critical. And we need to capture outcomes from different stakeholder groups and to obviously know whether we're making a difference. If you think back to the aged care example and that long list of social issues that, that I brought up, we and a whole lot of other people believe that if we start to measure outcomes more effectively, we can start to hopefully shift the curve. So there's such a clear um, lot of evidence for why you would measure outcomes and I'm sure that I'm preaching to a room of very converted people here. So where are we stuck and why are we stuck? We face a whole lot of challenges. It's really hard. Collecting outputs is much, much easier than collecting outcomes. We all know that. We often start with poor foundations where um, we don't necessarily have a theory of change, so we don't really know what we're measuring. There's uncertainty about what should be measured. We struggle a real lot with poor data. Data is often siloed, it's inappropriate, it's incorrect, it's missing. Outputs are often misinterpreted as outcomes. Proxies, things that we want to account um, as outcomes for certain things we're trying to achieve are often poor. Some proxies are made up that actually have nothing to do with the outcome we actually want to achieve. Indicators can be poor quality or indicators can be used that actually can't be benchmarked or compared to anything that exists, including at a population level. And we rarely have shared measurement. We face challenges around resources, capability, capacity. Time is really tricky. Time in terms of how much time you've got, but also what do you do with time when you're measuring? Do you, do you measure retrospectively? Do you measure in the present? How do we track, track, track changes into the future? Ideally, we should be setting up outcomes so we can do it at multiple time points. And it takes a whole lot of capacity. It takes a whole lot of skills and resources and, and people and tools to actually measure outcomes effectively. And I think one of the biggest things is people really, really struggle with the complexity of navigating the space. There are so many guides and bits and pieces out there around measuring outcomes. There's a huge list of possible approaches. Which one do you pick? How do you apply the tools? How do you decide what to use, when to use it, and how? And then there are obviously a whole lot of practical challenges when you go about data collection and analysis. The other interesting one that I think we should look at trying to tackle are the organisational uh, distractions and barriers. And we started this conversation with the importance of leadership. And I think that there's definitely a whole lot of challenges around some organisational and systemic uh, barriers to measuring outcomes that as leaders we can start to overcome. Incentives aren't aligned really to measuring outcomes in a whole lot of places. Funding often still isn't tied to outcomes. There are contractual demands that really create big barriers to measuring outcomes. For example, things around intellectual property, not being allowed to report, not being allowed to share data. Um, a lack of transparency is often in relation to a fear of sharing failures. Um, we have a whole lot of issues around who owns what, particularly when we're looking at collective spaces. There are big questions around attribution and not measuring outcomes because I want to own which part of the, the puzzle do I own, when actually what we're trying to achieve is social progress. Um, and, uh, and a lack of senior management support has been found to, to uh, be a barrier to measuring outcomes. It's, it's important to raise the discomfort of all of these problems and about where and why we're stuck. But um, don't look at that just yet, I'll explain it in a sec. Mm -hmm. But we don't really need to be, feel completely helpless about all this. I do want to paint a picture that is urgent enough that we've got to do something about this. It's time to change the way that we act and behave. But actually there's some hope. There's definitely been some shifts in the right direction. I'm going to give you just a couple of examples. <coughs> 
So this example here is the disability employment services um, outcomes. Basically what happened in 2013 is, is that the government decided to start releasing disability employment services outcomes, which is fantastic. It's a great example where we have an outcome measure or two outcome measures that are the same outcome measures across the entire sector and they're basically putting it out there on a website to say here's the employment outcomes. If somebody comes to me with a disability and I'm a disability employment service provider, I have to provide the data on and the blue is whether is, is the proportion of people who get a job when they turn up to this disability employment service provider. The red is whether you keep the job after 26 weeks. And you can actually look at this data by disability type, which I've just graphed here for you, or you can look at it by service provider. So I can go in there and know who my disability employment service provider is and see how they're doing. And how are they doing compared to all the other disability employment providers? I think the great news about this graph is, is that for the first time, we can actually see which services are getting best results for, for who with disability, and we can <coughs> dig into context we can easily go to a website and find out who the client group is that, that a particular provider is trying to target. <coughs> the alarming thing about this graph are the results. So if you've got a disability and you're using a disability employment service provider, these are people who want jobs. They're trying to get jobs. On average, you've got about a one in three chance of getting a job with the help of a disability employment service provider. One in three. It's pretty ordinary. What's more alarming is once you get the job, you have a less chance of keeping the thing. So you actually have a one in two chance, if you turn up to a disability employment provider, of getting a job and still being there after 26 weeks. Slightly frightening. But what I hope that this type of outcome measurement will do is start to generate change. We see organisations, and I'm just going to give one example and there are others and you can look at the data. You see organisations like Job Support that has very good outcomes actually using the information for their particular provider to say, we are three times a national average. If you come to us, we have, you've got three times as much chance of actually ending up with a job. And so that's the kind of market forces that are going to start to shift change in these kind of areas. In other social issue areas, governments are making commitments all over the place um, around developing frameworks, measuring outcomes, doing a whole lot of stuff. But I think there's a whole lot of holes that we have to be wary of and be careful of. Um, let's take the family support program, for example. Years ago, I was involved in evaluating the Communities for Children initiative, which was a massive quasi-experimental design, almost like you know, as good as an RCT as you can get for a human service delivery program. Huge investment in that evaluation, nationally wide. It, it, it was really um, an impressive government investment in measuring outcomes. And it led to a whole lot of changes as a result. Unfortunately, though, in 2009, it was found that the monitoring and reporting arrangements that had been established by Faxia were, um, and I'm just looking for, for what was said by the, by the audit, um, were actually just measuring activities as opposed to measuring outcomes. And as far as I know, the current family support program, which supports about 400 organisations, doesn't have a shared outcomes measurement. And if it does have shared outcomes measurement, then it's not something that's publicly available and that you can see. From an international perspective, there's also been a whole lot of shifts. Um, foundations like the Gates Foundation have basically almost stopped asking for people to report activity. They don't want to know about the activity. Don't tell us about your busy work. Tell us about what you've achieved. And they've started to change that in terms of their reporting. Um, the other great example is um, something called Magnolia Place. Um, Magnolia Place is a community initiative. It's a collective impact sort of collaborative type of initiative in the US. And what they've done is generate this community dashboard. And I'm just taking a snapshot of some of the dashboard that you can see. It's not perfect and there are issues with some of the indicators that they use, 
but it's actually a fantastic initiative in that all of the organisations that are striving to improve community outcomes in this Magnolia Place initiative are using the same outcomes, they're publicly reporting it, it's actually available for people to see how they're tracking. And it's an excellent example of the type of initiative that we could easily do here in Australia. Okay, I'm gonna just um, finish off by now sort of talking a little bit about how we might move forward in navigating some of the complexity of outcomes measurement. It's not a very easy, uh, easy space um, to, del to delve into. And CSI at the moment is de developing a bit of a handbook around making outcomes measurement meaningful, which we're going to launch at our Think Outcomes conference, which I'll put up on the screen at the, e the end of this. But in the meantime, I've got a couple of key messages for you around navigating the space. Firstly, take a stepwise approach. This is, in any of the literature you read about measuring outcomes, you know, anyone that has anything worthwhile to say says, take a stepwise approach. Start from a found, you know, start with your foundations and, and basically build. The new philanthropy capital in, in the UK, for example, recommend a four pillar approach. And there are lots of those types of things of pillar approaches. But it's basically a stepwise approach. You map your theory of change, you prioritise what you need to measure, you make sure your evidence um, and your approach matches that and you select the right tools um, and so forth. Um, in terms of that stepwise approach, getting the foundation right is critical. If your foundations aren't there, like as if you're building a house and you build the house on stand, it doesn't matter how beautifully constructed the rest of the house is, it's going to fall down. Your foundations absolutely matter. So the step of getting your foundations right, one of the most commonly recommended things is making sure you have a theory of change in place. Organisations need to think through and articulate what achievements are actually desired, how you think you're going to get there, what evidence you have to say that the activities you're doing are going to achieve the outcomes you want, and then what might be realistically achieved and how you're going to measure it. Epstein and Eunice um, interviewed 50 organisations across sectors in their, for their 2014 book. And this is what they reported. A common explanation for lack of effectiveness is that the organisation has not been clear enough in its definition of success and lacks a well-defined logic model that would likely lead to success. Too often we find serious gaps in the logic model and little evidence that activities are likely to lead to the proposed impacts. So not only do you need the logic model, it's got to be good. Don't just create something and have a whole lot of holes in it because your foundations are still going to be dodgy. Secondly, it seems really obvious, but you've got to understand the purpose of, of why you're measuring and what the scope is. It's important to understand what different stakeholder <coughs> needs are, and by that, it's thinking about helping inform you on what you measure, how you measure, what compromises might need to be made. So if there are contractual deliverables, what do you need to do for those, for example? and ensure that the measurement works for the organisation that has to do them, because otherwise it's not going to be done well um, and we're not going to see shifts in terms of organisational learning or changing outcomes. Joe Barraquette recommends that fostering organisational readiness is really important for measuring outcomes, and I think that's a really nice point. Organisational readiness um, is a cultural shift. It's not just about putting things practically in place around change. Thirdly, make sure that whatever approach you pick, it matches purpose and context. It's amazing how many tenders or requests for tender that I've read which have, we want somebody to use an X approach to understand our impact in. I go, that's really interesting. Is that approach actually the best approach you could use to measure the problem? And if you need an expert to measure it, do you also need an expert to advise on what might be the best, best approach to take here? Don't get those in the wrong order. There's a whole lot of, of approaches that you can use. There's a whole lot of traditional evaluation theory-based approaches. I won't go into their long list of them, but they're, they're rigorous and they're good. There are a whole lot of economic analyses. They're very different. Cost-effectiveness analysis, cost-benefit analysis, um, 
for, and, and other economic analyses are, are different beasts and will give you different things. Rates of return approaches, social return on investment, for example, really popular um, at the moment. It has its advantages and its limitations. Have a think about what approach it is that you might need for what you want to achieve. There are also a list of integrated approaches, integrated reporting, social accounting and audit, results-based accountability. There are a long <coughs> list of all of the types of approaches that you could use. So the main message here is purpose and scope should drive the approach that you pick, not the other way around. Any good measurement, whatever approach you, you actually use, needs quality indicators that are credible, that are rigorous, that are reliable. It's also really important to recognise the difference between measuring outcomes with and without understanding what processes are actually driving those outcomes. Let me give you an example. If we were to go and do something in early childhood and we actually find that our outcomes are terrible, do we know whether the outcomes are terrible because the idea was terrible in the first place or because the implementation of the idea was terrible? If we don't actually also pick up some of the process evaluation, we won't really be able to tease out the difference between those two. If collective impact doesn't work in a particular area, is it because the initiatives or um, the activities that are going on to address whatever the social issues that that collective is trying to address, is it because those ideas are bad or is it because something's wrong with the partnerships and that they're not actually effective? Finally, some other considerations. Timing I talked about already, it absolutely matters to, to consider. Um, and really, data should be collected in real time and to be able to be tracked in the longer term if we're actually going to be serious about this making social progress. And of course, you want to be able to benchmark against standards. Organisations want to be able to benchmark themselves against other organisations. You want to benchmark against sectors. You want to benchmark against communities. You want to be able to benchmark against the population. And if relevant, we want to be able to benchmark internationally. Quality is critical. <coughs> Measuring for the sake of measuring but not doing it well is not better necessarily than doing nothing at all. We can waste a whole lot of resources and sometimes do more harm than good by having poor measurement. Remember that not everything can be measured and not everything can be measured numerically. Know the limitations of the approaches that you pick. Finally, uh, shared measurement, leadership and transparency. I'm going to sort of throw these together. I talked before about leadership and how important leadership actually is in driving measurement, measuring outcomes effectively. It's absolutely important that leaders foster this culture of transparency and that it's okay to share outcomes and it's okay to share where we, where we failed and what we can learn from each other. That means that we can then have a culture where we can have shared, systematic, transparent approaches to data collection, to analysis, to reporting. We'll then be able to track and understand different outcomes through different interventions over different time points and in different contexts. It's also going to help organisations because organisations working on similar issues can learn from each other. It will save cost, it will save time, it will mean it doesn't have to be an expert sitting in every single organisation that can do research. And it will increase the quality of, of what we actually get and build an evidence base to create, hopefully, social change. I actually spent about oh, just over a decade doing individual evaluation type of projects. And there's a lot of merit in a whole lot of the work that, that I've done historically. I worked with dozens of NGOs, government departments at all levels, local, state, federal, and, and, and um, for-profits on tens of individual projects about mental health, about disability, about early childhood, about disadvantaged families, about other place-based type of initiatives, a whole lot of policies. And the individual evaluations can be really important. Some of the work that I've done historically has had really great policy impact. But I think that there's some challenges that I've faced in doing those individual evaluations that if we had shared measurement, we might be able to overcome. And these are just some of the challenges that I've noted um, 
in reflecting on sort of 10 years of doing this stuff at an individual level. I think that without shared measurement, things rarely change. They don't change enough and they don't change very quickly. It's really hard to make change scalable, even if you do have a win on an individual measurement project. It's very, very easy to hide the results. It's terribly unfortunate because of contracts, because of changes of government, because an organisation doesn't like what, what the results will say about them because of worry about branding. We, ha we don't learn from other people's mistakes. We could rewrite the report and just change the name of the organisation. Here's all the problems. I don't really do that. <laughs> It means that we have this con culture of competing individual agendas that often conflict um, about what's evaluated and shared and reported, which can really compromise quality. There's a huge amount of fear of failure, which leads to lack of transparency. If I were to share my individual evaluation that somebody else doesn't, what does that say about me? What do I have to worry about? Context and comparability are often completely overlooked. And sometimes risks can be so minimised that we don't make progress. And an example of a risk would be a government department, an NGO, corporate social responsibility, a philanthropist, saying, I want you to measure this and tell me what the outcomes are and how we're doing, but we don't know whether we ever want to publish the results. And we don't know whether we're ever going to let you publish the results, but we'll tell you whether you can publish the results once we get the answers. People are nodding. It's not uncommon. It's an incredibly common experience, um, and it's one that that we very rec you know we recently had uh, at CSI. I think the other thing about individual evaluations is sometimes it can be busy work, and busy work can be a distraction about the big picture work that we need to do in this space. Let me wrap up. I think now more than ever as we face major demographic shifts and as public spending expenditure is really shrinking in, in this diminishing economy, it's really time to start to measure what actually matters. It's time to look at what we're doing in different sectors and to ask some key fundamental questions. Are we measuring what matters? Are we measuring it well? Are we tracking change over time? Can we compare change at an organisational level, at a local level, at a sector level, at a population level? I think we all know, and I think there's been enough of a shift to understand that measuring outcomes actually matters. It's now time for finding the right pathway to do something about it. It's time for asking the tough questions about what's actually stopping us time to overcome barriers to shared measurement and transparency and I think it's time to commit to some action. Let's progress the measurement of social outcomes for Australia. Let me leave you with a couple of questions to ponder. What would it actually take to make the shift within sectors, within departments, within units, within groups? What would actually help us make progress and what's your role in this? Mm.